All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Farr, she, her pronouns. I am a distributed organizer with the Sierra Club Pennsylvania chapter. Um, welcome to the briefing, our weekly series of live legislative updates. During each 30 minute episode, you're going to hear about what's happening in Harrisburg and how you can get involved. Uh, we are holding the briefing every Monday for the next couple of weeks during the kind of the peak of the spring legislative and budget season. Uh, and each week's coverage is going to evolve to reflect uh, what is going on in Harrisburg. So our next session is going to be next week on June 12th. Keep in mind that this is being recorded. So on the Tuesday following each session, you're going to receive a video recording and a link to the briefing digest, which is um, our documents list of everything that we're going to be referencing here today. Um, we're also going to be posting all of these resources on the briefing webpage, which you can find on the Sierra Club Pennsylvania chapter website, uh, www.sierraclub.org slash Pennsylvania slash briefing. Note that the Zoom link and call-in number does stay the same for all of these sessions, so you don't need to re-register for every week. Uh, we'll just go ahead and remind you every Monday, but if you are here today uh, without having had registered for today or the previous session, please at least register for one upcoming meeting so that we do have your email address. Um, and of course, we want you to get involved and we're recruiting new volunteers for our volunteer lobbying team. The links to sign up for that will also be included in the briefing digest. So today I'm honored to introduce Jen Quinn, Sierra Club Pennsylvania's legislative and political director. Jen is going to be sharing a slide presentation, but for those of you who are just listening in on the phone, we'll be sure to read the content out loud so that you're not missing anything. And of course, you'll get a copy of those slides with the briefing digest tomorrow as well. Um, we ask that you please hold your questions and stay on mute until Jen is done doing her initial set of updates, and then we'll have plenty of time to take your questions. All right, so with that, I will turn it over to Jen. All right, Any, everyone can see that. Can I get a thumbs up? Great, all right. <clears throat> Thank you folks for, for joining us today. So I was in Harrisburg all day, so I do have some um, interesting and exciting updates. But before we do that, I'm just gonna rewind to May really briefly and slag um, a resolution and a bill that was actually passed by the House. So we had HR 87, which was a resolution from Re Representative Daly directing the Legislative Budget and Finance Committee to conduct a study of conservation corridors for wildlife connectivity, right? When it comes to crossing roads and um, <clears throat> rivers and, and things like that, the importance of that. And then we also had a bill pass um, directing PennDOT to use native vegetation for roadside work. Now I'm, I'm flagging this, not because these are monumental bills, but to sort of set the tone that this is the sort of work that's getting done in Harrisburg right now when it comes to the environment. Um, small steps, not a bad thing, but you can see even with the, the resolution on conservation corridors, 72 Republicans voted no on this. Why? I have no idea. Um, so still very difficult to get things done, but some, some small steps taking place in Harrisburg. So um, June is budget month, a very, very busy, busy month. Um, these are the days the legislature will be in session. They can always um, add more days if needed. We usually have, you know, more session days in June than we do for the whole, you know, first six months or last six months of the year. So a very, very busy time in, in Harrisburg right now. And so what, what we're expecting um, so for House Environmental Resources and Energy tomorrow, June 6, they are holding um, a voting meeting on a pretty, pretty heavy agenda of bills. So House Bill 652 from Representative Bullock, there was actually a informational public hearing on this bill today um, in ERE. This is a really important issue, cumulative impacts. Currently, when permits are issued for projects, the DEP and agencies sort of look at things in a vacuum. They don't take into account a facility two miles down the road, a facility five miles down the road, another facility you know, in the same neighborhood. And so this bill would require cumulative impacts to be considered when issuing permits in already burdened, um, burdened communities and environmental justice areas. This is um, a priority for the administration. Um, DEP is supportive. And so we are expecting a committee vote on this tomorrow. 
Um, then House Bill 1172, this is um, allowing alkaline hydrolysis. I don't know if folks are familiar with that, but this is an alternative to cremation that involves water and chemicals. Um, again, scheduled for a vote. I'm, I'm assuming it will get a committee vote. Um, and then some of the some of the bigger bills, um, House Bill 1215. This is if folks remember the tax credit, the hydrogen tax credit bill um, from last year. It was slipped into the budget. This would sort of make that credit um, a little tighter. It would um, increase the tax credit for green hydrogen and apply the tax credit only to spe specific end uses like hard to decarbonize sectors instead of essentially being like carte blanche for the industry. So again, not a big step forward, but trying to just tighten up and, and make back some of the ground that we lost last session. Um, and then House Bill 12 1282, those of you familiar with um, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, that has a foothold here in Pennsylvania. There's quite a bit of it going on. Um, and they get sales tax exemption for their equipment. And so this bill would eliminate that um, sales tax exemption for these uh, facilities. It's called that they use the data center sales tax exemption, but they are not data centers, but they still qualify for this tax, tax credit. Again, just sort of trying to claw back some, some stuff that's been lost. And then um, House Resolution 131, a severance tax audit. This is from Representative Steele um, looking for a study on you know, what we're missing out when it comes to the severance tax. I know she has a lot of interest in the severance tax and the impact fees. So um, having a study, a report done on you know, what, what all of the resources and revenue we're missing out when it comes to the severance tax. Um, <clears throat> and then the Senate, ERE will also be meeting, um, likely to consider um, Secretary Dunn's nomination. This should be the first step in, in finalizing her confirmation. They have been dragging their feet on confirmations for specific secretaries. You may have noticed that um, Secretary Negrin or Acting Secretary Negrin for the DEP has not been confirmed either. Um, there's a, a statutory limit. I think they have 25 session days. So they are uh, approaching that. It's probably around January, I mean, June 27th, that limit. And so they seem to be wanting to take these things as, as far as they can, um, dragging their feet on that. And then we're also expecting the Senate Environmental Resources Committee to have a carbon capture and sequestration meeting soon. It has not been um, sunshined yet, but we are anticipating that uh, meeting to happen sometime within the next few weeks. So <clears throat> I mentioned this bill during the last call. This is um, House Bill 962, restoring uh, DEP's authority to raise bonding amounts for conventional oil and gas drillers. This authority was stripped away last session by House Bill 2644. Um, this bill will likely get second consideration on Wednesday and then a possible floor vote um, is likely next week or the following week. And you know, please keep in mind <clears throat> when it comes to a oil well, gas and oil well abandonment, this is not a legacy issue. This is happening all the time in Pennsylvania and we continue to saddle taxpayers with hundreds of millions or billions of dollars um, in cleanup. So this is a really important bill. Again, not as ambitious as we would like, but given the political reality, it will rewind things back um, pre Act 96 of last year and just restore this authority. So want to flag for folks. So what, what you can do is just make a really quick call to your state rep. It should probably take less than 30 seconds of your time or about 30 seconds of your time. We have a quick script here on the screen. We'll also include it in the notes. Just please make a quick call and let them know that this is a good bill and they should vote yes on it. It's not a controversial bill if you're not a part of the gas industry. Um, and again, just rewinding things back to about a year or so ago to, to sort of fix something that went really wrong. So budget, this is um, the big the big news of the day. Um, <clears throat> so House Bill 611 looks very much like it will be the budget vehicle this year. Um, it's very early for us to know this information. We usually don't know the budget vehicle until a few days before they're voted on. But today in um, the Appropriations Committee, the House Democrats adopted their amendments to Governor Shapiro's budget proposal. It could get a final vote in the House sometime this week and then be pushed over to the Senate again pretty early um, in the process. Now, they House Dems issued a fairly generic statement that I'll share uh, what their 
hoping to do, looking to do. So there was um, no increase from the governor's budget of roughly 9% for both DCNR and DEP, which is you know, somewhat disappointing. These agencies have been strapped for a long time. Um, no increases there from the House Dems from the governor's budget, but there will be substantial investments in education, childcare, food security, support for hospitals post pandemic, public safety and violence reduction programs, veterans and seniors programs, and then also whole home repairs. I think I mentioned that on the last call, um, there is a $200 million allocation above the governor's budget for the whole home repairs, which is sort of a, a holistic program to keep folks in their homes um, and then to allow like further weatherization projects there. So um, it looks like this budget will likely be fairly mediocre. Um, like I said, it will likely go to the Senate soon. It can get bogged down there. Um, we're not really sure what's going to happen there. We know that Senate Republicans don't feel like they owe the governor a whole lot. Um, but some of the things I mentioned previously, and again, we're still thinking about that can be put into the budget, the, the crypto tax reform, I mentioned the hearing coming up um, with the crypto bill that could easily be slipped into the budget. Anytime we're talking about a tax reform right now in June, um, easily could be added to the budget. Same to changes to the hydrogen oh, tax credit. Easy. They could um, tighten that up. They could also expand that, something to keep an eye on. Um, House Bill 1032, this morning there was a press conference for the Solar for Schools bill, so it looks like they are trying to tee that up, which is a good bill. Um, I think roughly 30 to 50% of costs um, covered by IRA funding for school districts who want to add solar, so that's a good thing. Um, and then agency and funding, agency funding and staffing, again, if the House Dems didn't add any increases there, I'm, I'm very doubtful that uh, the Senate will do anything there to change funding or staffing levels at either um, DEP or DCNR. And then as far as timing goes, you know, it could be early. Typically, you know, it's the end of June, but, you know, 4th of July is usually the mark for a timely budget. So we're still expecting um, the budget to be on time this year. And as soon as the um, the official documents regarding these amendments and what's what's in them and what those numbers look like become publicly available, we'll add those to the notes so people have access to those to just sort of see what the House Dems are doing and compare to um, Governor Shapiro's initial uh, budget numbers. And then another issue that I will flag, and again, I mentioned this on, on the previous phone call, um, we are still waiting for a bill from Senator Yaw to be introduced regarding carbon capture and sequestration. We were expecting it last week. We're still expecting it this week. It hasn't happened yet. Um, I am mentioning it now because this could very well be slipped into the budget and that is deeply troubling and problematic. Um, when it comes to carbon capture and sequestration, there are very serious issues around liability. Um, who is responsible for things we injected underground for eternity and all the equipment? I don't, I don't think it should be the state. I don't think it should be the taxpayers, um, but that's a question that needs to be answered. Seismicity. Right? What happens when you inject these things underground? Are we inducing earthquakes and what happens then? Um, community benefits or protections, the communities that will be hosting hydrogen hubs and, and carbon capture facilities and wells, what sort of protections and benefits do they get? Core space, who owns that? So there are very significant questions that need to be discussed, debated, stakeholder input is needed, public hearings should be happening on this. This should not be put into the budget and I am flagging this for folks because it will likely be something we talk about the following week and the following week, um, depending on what I'm hearing and, and how the likelihood of this changes over time. But it is still a very definite possibility that something as significant as carbon capture and sequestration could be slipped into the budget unbeknownst to the vast majority of Pennsylvanians. But I'm flagging it for folks here um, as things progress. And if it looks like it's going to happen, you know, we can develop, you know, some talking points and call in scripts and things like that so folks can take action. But definitely something that um, I am concerned with. And then um, Melissa added this slide. Melissa, you want to talk about whole home repairs and call in day coming up? Sure. Yes. So uh, this is this upcoming Thursday. Um, uh, those of you that are familiar with the Here for CJ Coalition out of Philly, they are part of a statewide network of organizations um, focused on housing justice, um, efficiency, repair. Um, but they are promoting a call-in day to secure permanent funding for the whole home repairs program. Um, 
they want to both have that be permanent and then also, you know, sufficient amount of funding, right, so that they can actually achieve all the goals that were set with that legislation that passed uh, last year. So what they're asking to do, again, it's a real easy call in. Um, there's going to be a link to look up your reps. You may already know them and they already have a script put together that you can read off. Um, so they're having all of this. They want it to be all at once on Thursday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So we'll be promoting this on social. You may see it in your networks if you're part of other orgs as well. This isn't just a Sierra Club thing. This is a statewide multi-coalition um, effort on Thursday. So we'll get all of this to you in the Notes Digest as well so that you can be prepared to start dialing on Thursday. Great, thank you. And this is really timely considering the $200 million that the Democrats just proposed for this program. So um, right on time with, with the call-in day. I think that might be my last slide. Um, I think we can probably turn it over to questions. I can stop sharing my screen. Um, yeah, and we can answer questions. Anyone have questions? I know we threw a lot of information at you right now, but again, you'll get it um, in the digest and with uh, the recording of the presentation. But yeah, a lot happening in Harrisburg, so happy to answer any questions if folks have them. So we will go in the order of when I see the hands raised or if you put it in the chat. So I did see Mike come off mute first. So we'll go Mike and then I see Dave's hand. Um, so take it away, Mike. Thank you. Getting back to uh, your comments on, on Cindy Dunn, this is a Civics 101 question I am embarrassed to ask, but I guess I should know. Does she have to be uh, approved? every new term or is this still hanging from the previous administration this is um every new sort of go round so with the new administration so she was approved under wolf but since shapiro kept her she for whatever reason still needs to be approved as part of the new administration and she's okay. very well liked I, i'm not sure why they're dragging their feet on this john gordner yaw they all have good things to say about cindy so i, I don't know why they're dragging their feet on this one. I can see Rich Negrin. They don't really like the DEP, but Cindy's very popular. So they, they should confirm her without any issue. I just don't know why. They're so and this long. is hung up in a committee? Well, so um, the Senate needs to confirm, but it, it, the sort of confirmation process like begins in Senate environmental resources and they'll sort of kick it out to the larger Senate for like a confirmation vote. Okay, so there's nothing we should do at this point in time. Uh, I know really. Cindy personally, and I, I agree. Yeah, right. She's very likable. Right, right. Okay. Go ahead, Dave. I have several questions. One, why is the ERE uh, working on crypto uh, currency bills? I mean, isn't that environmental and uh, energy committee? It is the Environmental Resources and Energy Committee. So the problem with crypto is that it uses enormous amounts of energy. Like crypto mining is equivalent to like certain countries. And so we have um, certain data miners in Pennsylvania that are just hooking up to gas wells unbeknownst to the DEP. No permitting, no reporting. Um, and so they're just using massive amounts of energy. We also have waste coal facilities that are running um, by and large to support crypto, waste coal being one of the dirtiest, most polluting uh, energy sources out there. And this is also, you know, taking energy away from the grid. We have nuclear folks who want to do it too. And again, nuclear is cleaner as far as emissions go. But yeah, so there are a lot of environmental issues. There's emissions, there's permitting, there's reporting. Um, there are, yeah, there's a whole tax credit issue when it comes to waste coal that has made this a very um, enticing state for crypto. Thank you. Next question is, how, you want us to call in on House Bill 9, what is it? 962. It'll be um, in the uh, briefing notes that we send and in the recording. So House Bill 962 is just rewinding what happened with gas well bonding last year when they said DEP can't raise bonds. This says DEP, we're restoring that authority and you can raise bonds, um, which was in response to the Sierra Club trying to raise bonding amounts. Um, yeah, but it will be in the the briefing notes that Melissa sends the script. When, when, you, when do you want that to happen? Um, so it should get second consideration on Wednesday. So within the next week or so, I would say hopefully by next Monday, getting those calls in could be helpful if it 
because ideally it would then get third next week or the following week. And so I will update next Monday if it has gotten, you know, if it's slated for final consideration or not. But hopefully by next Monday, I think would be a good time for folks to get calls in. But just from my understanding of Sierra Club, is Sierra Club uh, creating any bills and getting any legislator to carry them? Or, and is there any order in what we should be, uh, I mean, yeah, let, let me just ask that first. Yeah, so we worked on um, the crypto bill. There's another crypto bill coming. Okay. We're working on a bag ban bill, the bonding bill. We worked heavily on the hydrogen bill. So um, again, like I said, given the political reality, they have to be small steps right now. So we're not getting a clean energy standard yet, but we're trying to fix some of the terrible things that happened over the past few years. I know House Bill 740 was to reduce, uh, uh, yeah, what DART, DART container makes, I think. Uh, but they, they aren't moving on a lot of stuff, it seems like, that are, that are real uh, energy type things that are pollution type things. Yeah, no, I'm I'm really flagging for folks just sort of what's happening now and what seems most viable. There are lots of good bills out there. We're tracking about 90 bills right now, but there are very few, like I said, the um, conservation corridors and planting along the roadsides. That's that's sort of what's happening, really small things right now. Okay, thank you very much, Jen. Go for it, Howard. Yeah, hi, Jen. Um, question on uh, House Bill 962. Um, that specifically uh, in, excludes fracked gas and oil wells. Is that correct? It does because, so uh, last session, House Bill 2644 passed and said, the DEP does not have the authority to raise bonding amounts on conventional oil and gas, fracking being unconventional. They did not touch DEP's authority to regulate bonding for fracking wells only for the conventional drillers. So that's why this bill is only addressing conventional drillers because they still have the authority to raise bonding for unconventional or frackers. It was this 2644 was just purely a favor to one industry. Okay, um, thank you. Any, okay, anybody else? Go ahead, Judy. Okay, for those of you interested in how destructive the Bitcoin industry can be, um, go to your libraries if you don't have a, a digital subscription to the New York Times. We had a huge survey, um, a huge article published online April the 9th, 2023, updated April the 11th, 2023. And it was about um, Texas um, and the Bitcoin industry. And I was particularly interested because the little town we used to live in back in the aluminum days um, is now centered to two um, major cryptocurrency, uh, what do you call them, plants or whatever they are called. One of them is the largest in America. And remember the storm they had in 2021 when people were dying and freezing and electricity was out of, uh, you know, Texas didn't have enough power. Well, during that storm, I'm going to read this. The state of Texas paid bit dear an average of 175,000 an hour to keep the computers offline. 175,000 an hour to keep computers offline. Over four days, Bit, BitDeer would make more than 18 million for not operating. And it gets into the little town we lived in, Texas, the destruction there and so forth and so on. But that's a pretty comprehensive read. And if anybody isn't scared um, and you want to get scared about this industry, go ahead and try to find this article somewhere. Your friends, if you don't have the digital New York Times, one of your friends probably does. Can you put that in the chat, please? Pardon? Can you put that in the chat? If I know how to, I will. <laughs> I'll try. Thank you. Judy, I'll look for it as well, um, and I can add it in our email. 
um, follow up if I if I come across it. You said it was yeah, April. I don't, I don't think Chad is going to let me do this. It says show previews. You have the date of that article again, Judy. I'll I'll look. Yeah, for it. right. It, um, let me scroll back. Um, okay, what's important are the authors. Sure. Uh, Gabriel J X Dance D A N C E, and um, the digital was first published April the 9th. 2023 and updated April the 11th, 2023. So uh, the title is The Real World Cost of the Digital Race for Bitcoin. Great. Thank you for sharing that. I will try and find it for everyone um, and link it to, to the notes for, for folks. Um, okay. Howard's hand uh, went up again. And then Dale? Um, yeah, just a, another question. I um, plan to uh, contact my uh, state representative uh, for House Bill 962, but uh, my state representative has 100% pro-environment voting record already. And at the back of my mind is the thought that, well, it's not going to make any difference. She's going to vote in favor of this. And the same thought comes up with regard to uh, a lot of the legislation in both House and Senate. Um, why do you think my uh, telling my state representative uh, to vote for it is going to add anything? Sure. So, well, one, um, as we know, no more, we're going to narrow this down and have some targeted work, but we're sharing it on this call because um, it doesn't hurt, right? I think elected officials hearing from their constituents is a good thing, right? Like you having a relationship, you weighing in is still a good thing. And then also if there's ever pushback, if someone else is saying like labor, this happens a lot with labor saying, don't do this. You know, it's helpful for an elected official to be able to say, you know, I got 25 calls on this today. Of course I have to vote for it. You know, even if they plan on voting for it anyway, it's a way to give them cover and to sort oh. of make their job easier. And so we do have some targets, like there are some specific Republican targets, we're going to do a little extra work um, when it comes to this bill. But in general, it's, you know, I think it's about relationship building and, and talking with folks, but also to, to provide them cover if somebody else is saying like, well, maybe you shouldn't do this. Gotcha. Thank you. Go ahead, Dale. Um, I'm confused about what you're saying about the home whole home repairs the 200 million is a federal program right no so um there is so just today so we know that governor shapiro had his budget proposal in march today the house democrats added their amendments to his proposal in that included $200 million for whole home repairs. Now, I don't have the details as to exactly where that's coming from. It may be some sort of IRA, um, IIJA related pot of money, but as of right now, there's a $200 million proposal to fund whole home repairs that just came from House Democrats today in Harrisburg. So um, that's, that's about all I know right now, but a, a step forward, a, a good thing to see as a program we've supported. Is it covering the same um, kinds of situations as the federal bill? So the whole home repairs um, is sort of a, a pot of money that allows um, repair projects around the house so people can stay in their homes longer, reducing blight, and then also make the properties available for additional weatherization programs. Like if you have a hole in your roof, they're not going to help you get new windows. Um, so yeah, it's the same, same program, same types of issues. I just don't know exactly where they're getting their money yet. I haven't seen that, uh, that level of detail yet, but it's where we are. For low-income people. Yes. <clears throat> environmental justice communities basically? Yes. Okay. Yep. It's for, yes, low-income folks who otherwise could not afford sort of basic, um, basic repairs. Okay. Is there any money in that to teach people how to do things themselves? 
So there is money in that for worker training so that local people are trained to have to complete these jobs. So somebody who was like a contractor or wanted to become a contractor um, would be trained to do these sorts of repairs. Yeah, that's part of the funding. Great. Thank you. Sure. All right, so we are at a couple minutes past 4.30. Um, last call for any final questions. Uh, before we wrap up, I see Mike's hand up. Go right ahead. Uh, the last time we, we met, uh, I had asked uh, about contact within the Shapiro administration. Uh, you guys make any progress on that uh, so that we could, on whether it's these issues or any other issues, environmental issues, that we could get into the inner sanctum? That fell off my radar, but thank you for reminding me. I will um, reach out to some folks there and and see how best to direct. Okay, and and one one of them that I I would like to bring to to their attention and and it and it's it's uh, Senate Bill thirty seven. Now it you might not think of it as an environmental related uh, issue. It's it's a it's a bill introduced to to ban texting while driving. Okay because it's a distraction. One of the ideas that I had was to write to, uh, to some senators and also to bring it to uh, the governor's uh, attention that there are other ways that drivers are distracted. And one of them is from illegally modified mufflers that uh, basically scared the bejesus out of us when they pull up alongside of us, uh, uh, behind us, or we're downtown walking, or even in, in, uh, out in the, the, the wildlands uh, hearing these. And there's, uh, there's other forms of uh, modifications. And so I just wanted to bring that up to see if, if that makes sense and how would be the best way to, to approach that and where that Senate bill is at this time, if you know. Yes, so um, let me see, am I unmuted? Yes, um, I'm gonna pull it up quick and let you know where it is. So uh, the prem sponsor is Senator Brown. And then it was um, reported out of transportation committee and received first consideration on May 10th and it has been stalled um, since then. So if you were looking to get amendments added to that, it would probably be best to talk to the prime sponsor, Senator Brown. And then there are also um, other co-sponsors, Langer, Hulk, Flynn, Stefano, Schwank, Centrociero, and Culver. There are also folks that could be helpful. And I can send you a link to that. Um, there, That's a good place to start. Thank you. Sure. All right, so with that, we will wrap up. Um, if folks have future questions that come up after we close, of course, send, send an email. Um, we will get the recording of this and our notes document to you ASAP. Um, I'm trying to get those out first thing the next morning. If not, even if I can get it out tonight, I will, but I'm not gonna promise. Um, thank you so much for coming. Our next uh, session is gonna be Monday, June 12th. Will that be at four o'clock also? Yes. Okay. Thank you both for for this. Thanks, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.